Hi there, everyone, and welcome. Today, we are talking about bronchiolitis in babies. My name is Sarah Hunstead. I'm a pediatric nurse, mum of two, and founder of CPR Kids, and I am joined by the fabulous pediatrician, Dr. Deb Levy. Um, Deb, for those who haven't tuned into our Wednesday antics before, can you introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Dr. Deb. I'm a holistic pediatrician and mum of two young girls. I currently practice in Sydney's eastern suburbs in Bondi Junction. But what I really love doing is spending time here online with Sarah and the rest of you so that we can chat about top tips and the real nitty gritty facts of what you need to know so that yep. you don't have to go to Dr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> because we know that that is just a rabbit hole of oh, just totally. crazy stuff. I know. And it's I stressful know. because, you know, it yeah. either totally overcalls symptoms or mm -hmm. misses really important things. So um, I think you have to be very careful about uh, where you go when you start yeah, Googling things. Exactly. I know. We are going to be talking about bronchiolitis in just a sec, but yeah. I do have something that I want to share. As a little, no, not an experiment, but just as a little tester, the other day in the office, we just Googled, my child has a red rash. You should have seen what came up like from yeah. oh my goodness so really so yes exactly that so we're trying to give you the good evidence-based practice so you know but let's get into bronchiolitis today why yeah, are we I talking know. about this because it's everywhere we are getting lots and lots of people contacting us we're hearing you know in the hospitals that we're getting lots and lots of presentations of babies with bronchiolitis and all sorts of respiratory conditions mm -hmm. um you mm -hmm. know there's influenza around everything's around at the moment because we're sharing our bugs isn't that wonderful well no yeah I, I mean and, and my daughter who's in year two her class alone i think there's seven or eight of them who are off sick and um Thankfully, none very sick, but not well enough to, you know, go to school. And, and I was just chatting to Sarah before we started this and I was saying, I think it's because for the last, gosh, 18 months or so, everyone has been isolating mm -hmm. <laughs> in one form or the other. And now yeah. um, we kind of just going back to normal living. And so all these bugs are coming out. Plus, it's winter. Yes. You know, so inevitably there are a lot more things going around and children are more susceptible to catching them. So, um, you know, I think that bronchiolitis is a really important thing to talk about because not mm -hmm. only is it so common, but it can cause a lot of stress and distress. Yeah, absolutely. And at the end of this too, I want to bust a couple of myths about yep. cold and, um, and catching things. Okay, so I want to do that. We'll do that at the end. Yeah. But first of all, let's get into this. Bronchiolitis, yeah. what is it? What causes it? Essentially, bronchiolitis is a viral infection. There are multiple viruses. Um, a very common one is called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. And um, it typically, it, I guess it kind of depends on the age, um, how the condition displays itself, mm -hmm. presents itself, is probably a better way to put it. You know, you or I, if we get that virus, we probably just get a cold or runny nose. But with little children, if they get that virus, it can actually cause inflammation in their lungs and in their air, li air, air linings um, and called bronchioles. <laughs> um, and yes. essentially what that does is it can cause difficulty for young babies with their breathing. Mm -hmm. And that's when we become concerned um, mm -hmm. because not only can that actually impact on their breathing and cause respiratory distress, which I'll go into in a second, Mm -hmm. It can also impact their ability to feed. So those yeah. are the, always the two things that we look at um, when it comes to determining the severity of bronchiolitis and what mm -hmm. we what we should be doing in order to support your child. Because I think it's very important to say that as for all viral infections or common viral common colds, let me just give that as a caveat. So as I said, I was like, that's not actually going to be true. For all common cold viruses, there's no yeah. specific treatment. So yeah. in other words, antibiotics do not help. Um, it's mm -mm. just what we call supportive treatment. Yes, that's exactly right. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things that we always need to be standing on our soapbox and shouting as well is that, you know what, that it, it, antibiotics are not for everything. And there's a reason why your doctor doesn't prescribe antibiotics for everything, which is a mm -hmm. good thing. Um, now, tell me, with bronchiolitis, what age range um, does it tend to affect the most? 
it, you know, it's the little baby. So typically mm -hmm. it's the babies under a year of age, but certainly it can be a little bit older as well. Um, and that's just an anatomy thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. babies' airways are small and they're more susceptible to inflammation. And yep. um, let me just, may maybe I should just backtrack a little bit also and talk about exactly okay. what it looks like. Just so Go that on. parents are aware of what to look for, um, because okay. then it kind of helps me explain what, what's happening with it. But um, typically what will happen is that your baby will start with the sniffles, with a bit of a runny nose, maybe a low-grade fever, low-grade mm -hmm. meaning around about that 38 degrees. Um, and then it can progress. Mm -hmm. And it can progress to either what you hear is wheeze, um, which is a sound that babies typically make on their expiration so when they're breathing out and it's like a it's a melodic sound it sounds like that kind of a sound i don't know if you can hear it properly oh, very good, yeah, good. <laughs> that's only about 20 years of practice that's got to be that um or it can actually cause crackles you know but that is normally something that we hear with our stethoscopes um when we're listening to your child's chest yeah. um what we, you know, if that progresses, your child can actually have difficulty breathing. And mm -hmm. um, that's something called respiratory distress. And if any of you have ever heard Sarah and I talk before, we've mentioned this many times and we've gone through all the signs. But um, what do you think, Sarah? Should we recap them? Yep. Let's recap. Here's Annie. Okay. So what do you do? Should I go through it? You go through it and I'll point it out. How does that sound? Sure. Okay. So, um, again, we're referring more to a younger child because there's certain things that are more specific to younger children. Just going yeah. from the top down. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the general state of your child is important. Mm -hmm. um, as a child in respiratory distress can actually start looking tired, lethargic, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, but going from this, the, the head down, looking at the nose first, mm -hmm. one thing that they can do is they can flare their nostrils, which little Annie there can't do but I can so which is a and that's what they're breathing so so if you can imagine when a baby's having difficulty breathing they're doing they're working really hard trying to get that air in so that's why they're actually flaring their nostrils trying to increase that capacity to suck air in mm -hmm. the other thing that you can actually hear is a grunting um, and that's a <coughs> sound when they're breathing and um, for any scientists out there, that's something called positive airway pressure that the babies are trying to um, create for themselves. They're trying to alleviate some of that distress. Um, if you notice when I was making that noise, I just automatically did this with my head because that's what babies do. And that's called head bobbing. And um, again, that's another sign of respiratory distress. Yes. Moving down a little bit to the neck and the sternal notch here, which is this little area just above your the, the chest plate between the clavicles. Um, it can suck in there. So mm -hmm. I kind of like I don't want to do it, but I can't really do it. There you go. Oh, Sarah does it much better than me. Um, and you can also see she's actually lifting her shoulders up as well. And um, children can do that up. I find I often see that in older children than babies, but it certainly can happen. Um, the other, then moving down to the chest is the rate of breathing. It's very common for babies to have what we call periodic or rhythmical breathing, where they can have periods where they're breathing a little bit faster, then they'll slow down, and they breathe a little bit faster, then they slow down. What we're talking about here is sustained increased work of breathing. I think it's always a good idea, um, you know, maybe now's a good time for a child as well, and then a warm room because I'm freezing today. Take the top off. Get an idea of exactly what their normal yep. breathing pattern is. Mm -hmm. So that you can then recognize abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, so what we look for is increased respiratory rate. I'm mm -hmm. not going to give you a number. It is not your responsibility to be counting. Um, and also sucking in. So again, remember, increased worker breathing. They're starting to use all their chest muscles and their abdominal muscles. So you can sucking in underneath the rib cage and between the ribs. Those are all the signs of respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. absolutely and I think I hope you noticed one thing that I did there is that I just didn't hold up Annie and keep her all zipped up I actually took her clothes yeah. off you can't assess your child or look at your child when they've got layers of clothing on their onesies up it's really really important that you strip them down to have a good look at what they're doing because often well you know your child can be relatively happy well looking kind of okay but you notice their breathing's a bit off and you undo and you go whoa hang on a sec they yeah. are actually really starting to work here and mm -hmm. so that's the important thing strip them down and yeah. as <coughs> excuse, excuse me. me oh goodness um 
Oh, yep. Oh, yeah, it, I guess on that, while Sarah's coughing, I'm just going to say it's very common for babies with bronchiolitis to cough. And it can sound like, um, not like Sarah's cough, shame she's muted herself now, but um, more of a, what I call a fruity cough, which is kind of, oh, shame Sarah, maybe get a, you want a cup of tea? <laughs> um, it more of like a fruity mucusy cough. And that's often because there is a lot of mucus, there are a lot of secretions, and it can sit on their chest and, and, ma and make them want to cough. Um, and that cough itself can actually last for quite a while. So if you remember initially, and I kind of went on a tangent talking about respiratory distress. Are we okay, Sarah? I'm all good now. Okay, okay I good. I, I think I inhaled something. I'm not sure what, but anyway. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, as I mentioned, the typical pattern is that um, it starts with a bit of a cough. Uh, sorry, it starts with a bit of a typical cold symptom, snotty nose. Then the breathing um, pattern can deteriorate with that cough, the wheeze, the increased work of breathing, and associated with that is often a period of um, decreased feeding. Um, and then that breathing improves, goes back to normal, but the cough can actually last for quite a few weeks onwards. Mm -hmm. Fevers themselves shouldn't be lasting for weeks. That's usually only the first few days. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Sorry about the dog interrupting then. She was extremely concerned about my coughing then and just had to come and check on me. on the bed. <laughs> so we've gone through what bronchiolitis is. We've looked at, you know, what causes it. We've looked at what you need to look out for as well. But if our child is diagnosed with bronchiolitis, first of all, um, you know, when should we be seeking help? Where should we be going? Should we go into the GP, to the hospital? What impacts that? And what can we do at home if we can stay at home? Sure. Um, it all depends on the age of your child, the general state of them, including their ability and how much they're feeding and um, how many wet nappies they're having. Yep. And then the actual respiratory component. So, um, you know, going back to the age, you know, a, a young child, certainly within um, certainly within the first month, if not the first three months, I would be seeking quite urgent review just to make sure. Yes. Because young yep. babies have very, um, very low reserves. In other words, they can get very sick very quickly. Yes. Um, the, the next point around if they're not feeding properly, if you notice mm -hmm. their wet nappies are either not as frequent or not as heavy, mm -hmm. you definitely need to seek um, urgent review. When and I, I say urgent, I mean, sorry, I was going to say. No, I was sorry. Say, and say, what's the other urgent? I would say try within that day to your own doctor. Yep. When, is that what you were going to say, Sarah? No, I was going to say that often you can be a bit sleep deprived as well. Mm -hmm. And so writing this down is really important because mm -hmm. you may not remember how much they've been drinking and how many wet nappies they've had and so on. So keeping a record yeah. of that when they're unwell is really important because that's much better when you're able to see the doctor um, that you can give them an accurate um, history of what's been happening. Absolutely. Um, when I would be calling an ambulance is when they have any signs of that respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if they've got any other signs of being acutely unwell, floppy, lethargic, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but definitely, if they've got any respiratory distress, I wouldn't be messing around. I would not be putting my child in my car to drive them because you're not with them. You don't know what's going on. Um, even if you've got someone sitting next to them, it's not the safest option. So respiratory distress, for any reasons, contact an ambulance. Everything yep. else can usually be seen within that day um, for younger babies. And, um, you know, if they've only got a cold, you probably don't need to go that day mm -hmm. unless they've got high fevers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And trust your instinct as well. If you're looking at them yeah. going, I don't know what to do. And when we say trust your instinct, we often have people say, well, but I don't know. That's the thing, though. If you don't know, if you're questioning, going, I'm not sure what to do here, that is also when you need to seek medical help. So it's calling, you know, uh, the health advice line that is in your state. Um, you know, they're the ones who can also help make decisions. Um, you know, it's ringing your GP. It's all of just seeking that help that's really important. And I'd love yeah. to quickly jump in and tell a story, too, um, about understanding that when it comes to respiratory distress in kids and remember we're just arming you with information here the idea is not to scare you we do not want to do that it is just empowering you with knowledge so you can make good decisions now when my oldest was little so she was under the age she must have been about nine months old um, she had a bit of a cold 
she, you know, wasn't quite right. And then I noticed that her breathing started to become a little bit more distressed. It was still the seeing the GP kind of stage. It wasn't the calling ambulance kind of stage. So I made an appointment, popped her in the car um, and was driving there. And I noticed that she became very, very quiet. And I looked over at her and she was doing this in her seat. She was gasping for air. She was having a colour change. And she that had happened really quite quickly. So I immediately pulled over, called an ambulance. What had happened is, is that she'd gotten what we call a mucus plug. So she was able to cough and recovered. And by the time ambulance was there, she was, you know, wheezing a bit, but relatively happy again. But it just goes to show that things can change. And so it's about making sure that if things do change, that you're aware and you might have to change what you're doing. And you may be calling an ambulance and so on and just be aware of that too because things can change quickly absolutely and i think um maybe now's a good time to talk about what parents can do at home yes definitely um as for any cold those kind of symptoms it's about treating the symptoms um with i look you know the whole panadol nurofen when to give how to give i i i'm not crazy about giving them Mm -hmm. And I always say, only give if you really have to. And mm -hmm. when do you really have to give? In terms of illnesses, I'm not talking about in terms of injuries and pain, because then you always give. Um, yes. In terms of illnesses, um, I think if a child's very, very uncomfortable, you know, mm -hmm. a fever, I've never given my children Panadol for a fever, maybe once actually. Um, but to me, a fever is the body's way of, mounting an immune response and fighting whatever's going on and we shouldn't necessarily just be knee-jerk treating it you know mm -hmm. um, yeah. hold it off until you really need to give it um, either you know that fever's approaching 39 and you know that you're going to start feeling uncomfortable um, or they they're very grisly and um, not happy at all so um, and back to what Sarah said about documenting always make sure that you know um, I guess how to safely acknowledge that you've given your child medication, especially if there's more than one caregiver. Mm -hmm. there, there's some wonderful um, trackers out there that you can use, either paper or online. Yeah, Alternatively, definitely. one parent told me what they did, and I thought it was such a clever idea. Um, they kept their medication in the bathroom, and mm -hmm. they had one of those whiteboard markers, and they would mm -hmm. write on the mirror the dose mm -hmm. and the time that it had been given and leave the bottle yep. there. And I thought that was yep. quite a clever way to do it. It's a great idea. Um, but whatever works for you. So yep. definitely document when you're giving it and we can we can do it live on medication. I know we've done one in the past, so we can just link to it um, yep. about Panadol and Nurofen. I've also done quite a few reels on it on my Instagram. You can follow me there at Dr. Deb Levy if you need a bit of, a bit of clarification on that. Um, yep. The other point to make is around the, the symptom control. So you've spoken about the fever part. The other mm -hmm. part is um, blocked noses or a lot of stuff. Yes. I'm a huge fan of standard saline nose sprays. Mm -hmm. um, little things like Fest and all those other brands, and they're all much of a muchness. Mm -hmm. And you can give a good couple of squirts. You're not going to overdose them. It's not medicated. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely before all feeds, it helps clear the nasal passages. And also yep. before a sleep, I think it can help. Mm -hmm. You can also get those um, sucky things for better way of talking calling them mm -hmm. either the manual ones or the electric ones. And yep. I know that a lot of people swear by them. I just personally never use them. Um, but and I, know, and I think in some traditional cultures, mums actually will suck out the snot with their mm -hmm. mouth over the child's nose. Yep. I was never game for that either. <laughs> um, but yeah. I know a lot of people do it with good, good results. So mm -hmm. definitely it's about clearing those secretions. And then it's about ensuring they're getting, getting enough fluid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for breastfed babies, they'll often need more frequent feeds. When, whenever a child is unwell, for whatever reason, I guess this is us as well as adults, we tend to become a little bit dehydrated. Um, either that's through having a temperature, so you lose fluid that way, or through breathing quicker, you lose fluid that way. Um, so you may need to feed more frequently. You may yep. also end up doing shorter feeds more frequently. Um, the important thing to monitor there is the wet nappies, which we've touched on already. Because, yep. you know, really when, it, when you present with your baby to the hospital, what will um, indicate to us whether or not they need to be admitted are, one, do they need oxygen and support for their breathing? Mm -hmm. Or two, do they need help with their feeding, which is often just a tube down the nose for a short period of time while their breathing settles down to the point where they can then feed and breathe at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, absolutely. So just to summarise that again, and also when we're talking about, um, I noticed we've we've mentioned a few different things here, ibuprofen, paracetamol and saline sprays. Um, Deb and I are not recommending any particular brands at all. That's really important. We, we're not doing that. That's something you can go and chat to your pharmacist about and you choose what you do there. Um, but we're giving paracetamol or ibuprofen for comfort only when they need it. So purely for comfort, um, for, for that relief. Otherwise, there's no need to um, routinely give that at all. So we're talking about a saline spray, particularly before feeds, to be able to help clear that as well. Lots and lots of extra fluids for them too. And, of course, um, routinely checking on them. So, you know, we want to watch if they're deteriorating at all. If they are deteriorating, we want to seek help again. Even if you've already been to the doctor and they're getting worse not better you've got to go back again okay and just so just be aware of that and yeah. um how long deb just before we get to some questions mm. how long would you expect bronchiolitis to last and what tend, does it tend to peak at any time <laughs> i know what you want me to say so i said it usually peaks on about day four or five of the illness <laughs> and and day one is the day that um, they get a bit snotty so it's you know plus or minus a fever there's always like a range of what's normal be aware of that so um yeah. you know if your child is suddenly worse on day two it doesn't mean that there's yeah. something different going on. but yeah. um you, usually as i said it starts with that mild cold gets worse yeah. and then starts to get better and what peaks yeah. is the respiratory difficulties that cough yeah. can last for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So we've got some questions here. So let's go through those. First of all, Kate has said, if her baby who's nine weeks old develops bronchiolitis this winter, is it likely to, to develop residual long term respiratory conditions such as asthma or croup or things like that? It's a really interesting question, Kate, because we don't really know the answer. Um, there seems to be some link between RSV, so that respiratory sensitivity virus, if you remember, I mentioned that right in the beginning, um, which is a common cause of bronchiolitis. There seems to be some kind of a link between recurrent bronchiolitis and asthma. But the question is, is a child who's destined to get asthma just more susceptible to getting bronchiolitis, or are these recurrent episodes of bronchiolitis um, causative of asthma? We don't really know the answer to it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's definitely more asthma than croup. Um, mm -hmm. But it's one of those, you've got to look at the whole picture, you know. So if you come from a family who's everyone's asthmatic, got eczema, food allergies, you know, all those conditions, um, and then you find your child starting to get a lot of cases of bronchiolitis, unfortunately, it seems like they are going along that same path. Mm -hmm. But we don't know for certain. Okay, excellent. So Sarah has asked, how long is the contagious period? Um, it's as for any cold, which unfortunately is often a few days before. And then certainly while they're febrile, certainly while they've got a lot of um, nose gunk. And then it slowly, the, the viral load slowly decreases. And, yep. and obviously while if, if they're coughing a lot and, mm -hmm. um, and have that respiratory distress, they're also contagious. That's why we need to do lots and lots of this when they're asleep. And this is hand washing, hand washing and hand washing. It's, it's, not, it's not rubbing our hands with glue. So if, I, if only we did this and it was fine, that would be fantastic. Yeah. But you need to add some soap and water into that as well, yeah. okay? Yeah. So, right. so um, Sarah has also said her husband and I just text each other. So she's talking about the medications there. So we're talking yeah. about how recording medications, like writing on the bathroom mirror, texting each other is also a great idea too. Okay. So Rick has asked, what are your views on humidifiers and vaporizers for little babies in general and to assist with respiratory issues? I'll take the safety side of that for a sec first. If yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You want to start with that? Sure. So the um, thing that we worry about um, with vaporizers, uh, particularly, you know, when they're the ones that are heating up the water to create the steam in the room is burns. Um, there certainly is a common way for children to get burns. So make sure that if you choose to use a vaporizer, that it is kept up and out of reach. And also um, there are some vaporizers or um, I can't remember what they're called, um, the things that you put essential oils in, diffusers. diffusers. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Um, that uh, if you choose to use those, remember there are some that children should not be exposed to. Um, it's a whole it's a whole 
other subject talking about this. But remember, natural doesn't mean it's not toxic. Some of these can absolutely be toxic. So you're keeping them out of reach. And there are some that you absolutely shouldn't be using with kids as well. That's another subject. We'll do that another time. I think we've done it before as well, actually. Um, but Deb, do you want to talk about it from a respiratory point of view? Mm. Um I think that it can sometimes help um, mm -hmm. and it may be worth a try. I guess for me, the risks have always outweighed the benefits, but mm -hmm. um, I certainly know that for some children it helps. Mm -hmm. um, my, in terms of the risks, not just the safety risks that Sarah has spoken of, also I get worried about the risk of mould. Mm -hmm. um, because Sydney, if you, I'm not sure, Rick, where you are, but certainly in Sydney, the majority of people that I know both personally and professionally are all complaining about mould in their homes at the moment, mm -hmm. um, you know, from this crazy rainy period we've had for like an extended period. Um, and, you know, if you're putting in into a room more moisture, again, mm -hmm. you're going to have risk that you're going to have more mould and mould itself can cause problems for children's breathing. You know, so that's that's my thinking. But you know, in the in the moment of it happening, is it worthwhile trying a short period in a room? You know, go for it if you've got it at home. Um, yeah, I've, I've got kind of mixed views on it. What do you think, Sarah? Um, oh, I I would like to. I don't know of any updated evidence about this at the moment, so I'd yeah. like to withhold my judgment because. Yeah. Um, it's erring towards the no, um, to be yeah. completely honest. Um, yeah, from what I've read in the past, it's that it, you know, it, it's it, it may help um, for comfort, but certainly it's not going to do anything to the illness itself. We know that. Yeah. So if you're using it for comfort, um, you know, I, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to read a bit more about that before I add my judgment, to be completely honest. But we do know that it's going to make absolutely no difference to the length or, you know, severity of the illness they already have. So, yeah, I mean, look, I think that the times it's often used is for nasal congestion, you know, like, yeah. but this is often, this is obviously for older children or for yeah. adults, you know, the eucalyptus, mm -hmm. a few drops of eucalyptus in a steamy bathroom, that, yeah. that scenario. Mm -hmm. um, or, and I was also just thinking, you know, we do use it, a similar setup, like in terms of the masks in hospital. But yeah, yeah I don't know. I don't know, Rick. My, I'm, I'm like Sarah. I'm not 100% sure on, on the benefits of it. Yeah. Okay. So that's something that we can also have a look at for um, yeah. another time too. We'll have a look at what evidence is out there and get back to you. We can do that. Okay. Yeah. So um, we do have one more question. So Beatrice, I think we've covered this. Is bronchiolitis contagious? Yep. It is, definitely. Um, and so uh, Nellie's asked a question, but we can't give specific medical advice, unfortunately, um, because obviously without seeing your child. But I guess one thing we can answer is, is it common um, for a child to have repeated episodes of bronchiolitis? Um Yes, and a child can. Um, and I guess my whole query goes around, well, is this falling into the category of viral-induced wheeze? Yeah. Um, and that's something I would definitely chat to your doctor about, your GP, or even get a referral to a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, viral-induced wheeze, you know, a long time ago, we used to diagnose asthma in very young children, mm -hmm. um, the terminology. Yeah. You know, the, the societies have moved away from that and mm -hmm. now um, younger children are labelled as this viral-induced wheeze, which mm -hmm. essentially is yeah. wheeziness in the chest and difficulty breathing as a response to, you know, the com a common cold virus. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, to me, the bronchiolitis viral-induced wheeze as a child gets older kind of overlaps because, as I said, you know, RSV, which is the typical, and it's not the only virus that can cause bronchiolitis, but it's a typical one. Um, it, it can just cause a cold. And then a, a cold, if a child has asthma, can trigger the asthma. So it all becomes a little bit murky in terms of the terminology. I think that it becomes much more important in terms of how your child is best treated. So yep. um, have a chat with your GP or pediatrician. Yep, absolutely. Um, it, also, Nelly, uh, Queensland Children's Hospital have got a really good fact sheet on preschool wheeze as well. So go have a look at that. And I'm sure Deb on her Instagram page will have something hiding in there. I've got something on wheeze, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So go have a look. 
Yep, absolutely. So her handle is right there, Dr. Deb Levy. So have a look at that and the um, Queensland Children's Hospital Preschool Wees fact sheet as well. So have a look at that. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure, Rick and Nelly. I'm just seeing your thank yous. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So I think that might be all of the questions today. And remember, we want to bring you the stuff that you want to hear about. So please DM us with anything that you would like us to be talking about. So go on to Deb's Instagram page and DM her there or um, the CPR Kids page, and we will endeavour to bring you the subjects you want to know about. And please make sure you share this around with anybody who you think will um, uh, benefit from this information. And um, um, certainly on the CPR Kids page, I'll let Deb put stuff on her page, um, any references as well, but I'll be putting some stuff, uh, some fact sheets and things on the CPR Kids page as well. All right. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. See you.